Hi, welcome to the Bible study of First Baptist Church of Los Angeles. Today is the, um, let's see, today, what is today? Today's the 14th of April, 2021. Um, we're looking at uh, Revelation and now we've gone all the way through Revelation to chapter 20, which is probably one of the most challenging of the chapters we'll find in Revelation, not to say that other chapters aren't uh, challenging, but chapter 20 is, is certainly one that's both uplifting, encouraging, and yet to really grasp it, of course, it's a little beyond our comprehension completely, as we must understand that uh, within our human language there are limitations in terms of how words follow one another, are composed, and how they are pointing to a reality beyond themselves. And such is the nature of our limited language. And still within these words, within this revelation, God shows us that he will defeat evil. Uh, evil will have its judgment, and Satan will have, its, have judgment. And and also God's people will reign in the, be part of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on earth. Uh, we'll see all this in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, but let's take a moment to pray. We thank you, God, for the blessing of this day. May your word guide, inspire, uh, challenge us, and call us to a deeper faith. We pray this, God, in your name and in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in chapter 20, I'm just going to take it a section at a time. Uh, but looking at the whole, we see, of course, that this has come after some chapters of judgment poured upon the earth, a combination of times when God uh, is, shows grace and other times that God brings about the consequence of uh, disobedience uh, to people upon the earth. So this whole um, element of God in a process of judgment and redemption uh, it involves the opportunity for people to repent and turn to God and know God and be uh, brought into God's grace and covenant or to reject God and be uh, subject to the consequence of rejecting God and knowing the author of life and redemption. But here we find uh, the reality of evil has now uh, of course, uh, come to a point where God will determine that this is the time in chapter 20 to throw the Satan uh, into the abyss and to those that had uh, followed. Uh, we find here um, in, in chapter 20. Uh, let's listen uh, to this uh, very uh, powerful word of God. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Now, so here we see that uh, an angel, very strong angel from heaven, uh, comes and brings about judgment, the consequence of judgment for the devil, Satan. Um, Remember the word for Satan here is accuser, one who has uh, brought about both deception and uh, blasphemy, people uh, led into adultery uh, and idolatry, people not worshiping God, but, but worshiping the creation or worshiping things, idols. Um, and, and being led away from a relationship with God to a relationship of brokenness from God, a divorce, um, adultery, you could say, in the sense of 
not, not worshiping God, but worshiping things. And consequently, Satan tries to absorb this worship. But Satan now is brought into account. Um, the accuser, the deceiver, now is brought into account and is bound for a thousand years, thrown into the abyss, uh, locked and kept. And yet, we are even told, though, that this would be for a time, a, a period of time, a good period of a thousand years. Now, people will say, now, is this thousand years um, a literal exact thousand years, or is this a representation of a fullness of time, an epoch of time? And it, most scholars will agree that this uh, represents an epoch of time, uh, whether it's an exact thousand years is not really important. What is important is God brings about judgment for Satan and the deception that has brought the nations into disarray and brought much havoc, pollution, corruption, and destruction upon the earth, uh, the brokenness of humanity as a consequence of the deception and sinfulness. Satan is brought into account. And we find here then a transition. Now, we'll get into what this uh, millennial uh, reign is about here. Um, and there's this whole question of, okay, when Jesus comes, will, again, will it be, um, let's say, at a time when... Um, the, the, will this millennial reign come after he comes? Does it already exist in a way? Is this this element here of of the reign of Christ something? Is it something that, um, in a way, his reign exists within us and we overcome evil now? And that's kind of this amillennial point of view. The premillennialists will say we uh, are in this premillennial time when we are battling evil and eventually it will be dis, uh, there will be victory and, and, the, and the reign of Christ will come upon the earth at, at, at a time like talked about here. And then there are those who will say, well, we are to bring in the kingdom and, and then after we do the work of the kingdom, we'll reach a certain point where that work will help usher the way in for Jesus to come. That is a post-millennial point of view. Uh, you can see that there are certain elements to each point of view that give some semblance of, let's say, uh, virtue. Um, but mo most likely, this is referring to a pre-millennial point of view here in this passage, in this chapter. Really an understanding that Many things will happen and evil will be destroyed before Christ comes to set up his kingdom on the earth. Uh, if we follow the scriptures here, this is a premillennial point of view. And yet, there is something to be said for how we help usher in the kingdom. So for those in the 19th century, in the 1800s, it was really important to do mission work, to bring Christ to the nations. There was a sense in which the gospel needed to go forth to usher the way for the coming of Jesus, but that Jesus was to be brought to the nations. Uh, so a post-millennial point of view, if you want to, as referred to, often had this perspective of the church and its mission in preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. Um, I think you can make a case for learning from each point of view, the, the, what's called the amillennial point of view, would be that we have a sense in which the kingdom of God is already within us through faith in Jesus Christ and that God has already established his kingdom within us and he has defeated Satan. But the problem with that point of view is that though Satan is defeated through what Jesus did on the cross, he has not yet been uh, held into full account. He has not yet been locked away 
to deceive the nations and we see the reality of the rampant nature of sin and corruption and evil still and even more you say you can see in the world so really the amillennial point of view um, doesn't take into real into real uh, assessment the, the extensiveness and pervasiveness of evil even though people know God through Jesus Christ and know God through the covenant of Abraham now and the problem with the post-millennial point of view is that while you would think that the church would have made enough progress to bring the gospel to the nations and there, some of that has happened the reality is there's always going to be more work to be done and the church itself will not bring about the coming the fullness of the coming of the kingdom there must be intervention that will come and this is what we see in chapter 20 the intervention and really that ultimately it is the purview and power of God to bring about his kingdom on earth though we may help prepare the way so we see now in verse 4 and following I saw thrones in which were seated those who had been given authority to judge and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God they had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or the, their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, we see here then that those who had been faithful through the great tribulation, those who did not submit to the, uh, to, to the beast and the image and, and the dragon, you know, as referred to earlier, in, in, in essence, didn't, uh, give in to the evil and corrupt system that at some point will be so uh, dominant on the earth and so abusive and oppressive but believers at the time of the great tribulation will be called to stand forth and not uh, surrender or submit to the beast and his Im and the image and, and all the things that are part of that evil uh, and so it's interesting here that we see that those who were faithful and and many who were beheaded even um, would be restored there's a sense of divine justice here not just a sense a reality of ju divine justice they had not worshiped the beast or his image they did not receive receive this mark on their foreheads or on their hands that would allow them to be part of the system of trade and commerce and uh, to be part of this uh, very um, evil system that will someday uh, try to thwart uh, all the people to worship the beast and his image, uh, to su submit to that. These who were faithful to worship God and not worship any other, they will be uh, not only restored but given the responsibility the joyful responsibility to be a part of Christ's reign on the earth they came to life and they reigned with Christ and this a thousand years well it's a good long time um, now there's a then kind of a parenthesis here the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Now that's interesting. Does this mean that those who were faithful during the tribulation will be those who will be raised to life? Uh, it seems to indicate this. Um, then it also becomes a question, well then, when did the tribulation begin or when shall it begin or are we part of the tribulation now? Um, does this include martyrs? throughout the history of the church, or is this martyrs toward the end time? What's important here is not exactly uh, when uh, people will be raised, but the process that God has in mind and in store, that some will come to reign with Christ in this thousand year reign, and others uh, will be part of a second wave, you could say. Now, the kingdom of God in heaven is a reality uh, that exists now and for those who 
uh, die as believers in this life, they will be received into the kingdom of heaven. Their souls will be given new bodies, a resurrection or a new body in heaven. Uh, but this is referring to the kingdom of God on earth, and it's saying that this is the first resurrection. It's interesting, I mean, um, there's a mystery with all of this, of course. We have to just trust God and his timing and his plans. Uh, this may indeed be the first wave, and those who are to be part of this thousand year or more reign of Christ on the earth. Verse 6, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. During this period of time, you could say that God's people are going to be part of the restoration of the earth. God is not a throwaway God when it comes to this earth he's created. God after the defeat of sin, the judgment of evil, um, God has a plan for redeeming this earth that he has created, and he's going to involve his people. This matter of reigning has to do with responsibility and stewardship and care and restoration of the earth and people and relationships. Uh, it says here that the second death has no power over them they will be priests of God and will reign with him. So there is this blessed hope that the people of God will be part of the restoration and redemption of the earth and the peoples of the earth after all the judgment that will take place. Now, it's interesting though, something, uh, it goes on here in verse 7. When the thousand years are over, okay, a time will come when those, that period of restoration will come to its finale. Uh, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. So even though God will bring a era, a reign of goodness and righteousness, even though that will happen in the reign of Christ and the people of God on the earth, even though that will happen, there will come a time when Satan will be released from his prison. Uh, I mean, the question might be asked, well, why didn't God just say, okay, that's it, but with Satan, but there's something that still must change within the very nature of humanity that there will still be a residual of sin in the world. There will still be a residual of corruptibility. And this corruptibility and corruption still must be dealt with. There's still a refining work of God. God allows Satan to be released from his prison and he will deceive people again of all nations. The word um, and, uh, says the four corners of the earth. So corruption and is something that's pervasive among all human beings. And even though there will be a era of, of God's kingdom on earth manifest, there's still some more refining work that God is going to do. And so Gog and Magog will be gathered in battle. That means Gog is... Um, symbolic of uh, the nations uh, that are deceived by Satan. Um, so some people will say, well, okay, Gog is one country and, and Magog is another country. Okay, and then they'll say, well, Magog is from the north and Gog is from uh, the east and all that kind of thing. You know, it, what it really symbolizes is that the nations, be it here or there, be it Gog or Magog, uh, these different nations will be deceived. And they will get, and Satan will gather them for battle. As we saw earlier in Revelation, Satan is involved with propaganda, uh, deceiving people. And they'll gather in battle. 
In number they are like the sand of the sea, on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. This uh, being J Jerusalem, as we would think. Uh, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So there is still a residual element of evil and sinfulness and corruption in human kind that will that is still uh, going to have to be dealt with and we see that uh, in verse 10 and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown they will be tormented day and night forever and ever so the judgment comes to the devil, the false prophet, and to those who have allowed themselves to be deceived and are against God and his people. Verse 11, we then come to a judgment, the great white throne of judgment. Then I saw a great throne, a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. <clears throat> so here we see the final judgment. We've seen a whole process of judgment. We've seen other times when people had to appear before God for judgment. We saw ways in which judgment was poured out so that people would repent. But now we see the final judgment. And there is a dramatic activity in the cosmos, earth and sky being affected and, and people brought into the very presence of God, the great white throne. And those who were in the book of life, those who were in the book of life were received into heaven, into the kingdom of God. And those who were not experienced the second death. That means their souls all then perished as well. We have, in Scripture, two deaths, the death of a body and the death of a soul. Here we find that inevitably, whether you are in the book of life or not, will determine whether you are part of the kingdom of God and, and part of the eternal plan of God, or if you are not in that book of life that extends into God's kingdom eternal. And we find also here not only um, a death of people who do not believe that their souls would be uh, extinguished, um, that there's a second death, but we also find the, the death of hell and evil itself too. Um, so this lake of fire is part of the let's say, part of the um, final refinement and judgment of God. Now we'll see good news in chapter 21 as we go next week into this new Jerusalem, the new heaven and new earth that God creates out of all that we have seen in Revelation. It's all leading to the blessed hope of the new heaven and new earth, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, uh, a restored earth, and a time when there'll be no more pain. Indeed, God has a plan 
of full restoration, new life, and a hope beyond all of our troubles and trials now. So we'll get into chapter 21, but let's take a moment to pray. Thank you, God, for your presence, that you remind us of your kingdom plan through these words. May we not be so uh, proud to think we know it all. May we be humble to recognize that we must come before you in, in repentance, in faith, in hope, and turn each day in faith to you and let your light lead us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace.